Many are the faces of water, here where the land thirsts, and the canyons of the Uinta Mountains border Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. Once in centuries past, these waters ran wild to the sea, uncontrolled, unpredictable. Today, tamed at last between its stony banks, the river called the Green, plays a new role, visiting strength and pleasure, not only upon its native west, but upon the whole nation. It is of this we tell, a tale that ends where it began, billions of years ago, with water. the rugged canyons of Flaming Gorge, heaped up and shaped as if by some giant hand long before any of us were born. But it was not always thus, here where the green winds its way amidst them. For in the beginning, the earth was not so much earth as water. In this time primeval, two to three billion years ago, layers of rock that later became the Uinta mountain range, which today crowns the surrounding land, lay underwater as if asleep. No man ever saw this world a-forming. Only after the waters had retreated and advanced over and over, depositing and compressing new layers of soil augmented by volcanic ash from the mountains that rose and fell time and again. Only then, literally, was the groundwork laid for what was to come. Soon, in places, desert prevailed. Its ancient sand dunes sculpted by the winds are still to be found here frozen in time. Ages passed until some 150 million years ago, such beasts as this came to peer through the mists of time. Dinosaurs roaming the very area you roam now, leaving behind as their calling cards only their bones turned to stone. The mountains surrounding Flaming Gorge best tell the story of what happened thereafter. Slowly, 80 million years after the dinosaurs had come and gone, responding to tremendous convulsive forces within the Earth's crust, born of pressure and heat, the inner floor of the Earth, in a great giant uplift, followed by spectacular folding, heaved skyward and out, older strata covering the new as the rocky core of the mountains thrust up over its flanks, an action so powerful as to send the seas back to their present basins. Upon this newly created scene, once again, wind and rain and erosion began to work, gradually fashioning the Uinta Range as we know it today. And the Green River, shaping itself out of water already there, cut across the east-west lying mountains to take its course. High in the Wind River Range, the Green River is born, and yes, each year reborn born of the prevailing moisture-laden winds from the Pacific, milked by the surrounding mountains 13,000 feet above the level of the sea, to which finally it will make its way. Nowhere has this saga been better described than by its first scientific explorer, Major John Wesley Powell. All winter long, snow falls on its mountain-crested rim. 
filling the gorges, half burying the forest. When the summer comes, this snow melts and tumbles down the mountains in millions of cascades. A million cascade brooks unite to form a thousand torrent creeks. A thousand torrent creeks unite to form half a hundred rivers beset with cataracts. And half a hundred roaring cataracts unite to form the Colorado, which rolls into the Gulf of California. For ages, long before it had a name, the river flowed by with none to admire it. In time, flowers nodded as it passed, and animals came to use its water and roam its shores. For the sake of food, the Indians too came early to the river, not only seeking to fish and hunt the animals drawn there, but seeking water to irrigate the small patches of corn they planted close by. Primitive agriculture that nevertheless helped provide what they needed to live. The signs of their ancient presence can still be found on the walls of the canyons. Canyons they reserved for their gods and whose spells, as Powell put it, they wove into the myths of their religion. Strange, but it was fashion, specifically the beaver hat, that brought the first surge of men into the area. Trappers, led in 1825 by William Ashley, for whom the Ashley National Forest is named, seeking along the creeks the animal road to wealth. For 20 years, the fur trade flourished. Before, as always, styles changed from fur hats to silk. Then came the Longhorns, trekked up from Texas in the southwest, great herds of them to be wintered here at mountain-protected Brown's Hole along the green, before moving on to the eager and profitable markets of the far west. Unlike the trappers, even after the railroad came, the cattle remained. Cattle like these white-faced Herefords, today the principal industry of the Flaming Gorge area. And then, after the Civil War, then came the homesteaders. Promised 160 acres free if they would live on the land and farm it for five years. Amid the aspen, Hopefully, they built their cabins and tackled the hard soil by the green. Their abandoned tools still there today give evidence of their struggle. For the Green River, upon which they counted as their best hope, proved unreliable. Rich with water in the spring when the snows melted in the mountains. And virtually dry in summer when their crops lay parched and spoiling. Often in vain, individually and in communities, they dug canals, dammed up water in catch basins in the mountains, stretched viaducts along the steep hills to carry the precious liquid home, drew up plans for water projects that might save them, but which they couldn't afford. It was a hard life, a life not designed for all, and many, mind-weary and body-worn, their dreams dried out, finally gave up and moved on, leaving behind their monuments like a pattern of their failure, stark against the sky.
His story is celebrated in pictures today. Major John Wesley Powell, who had lost an arm in the Battle of Shiloh. But back before the surge of homesteaders, back in 1869, no one knew much of the man who daringly pointed the prow of his boat down the green, as no one before him had. Wrangling government backing for two separate expeditions, he followed the green to the Colorado and beyond, surviving all manner of strange adventure, yet all the while keeping his journey. At a distance of one to 20 miles, a brilliant red gorge is seen. This is where the river enters the mountain range, the head of the first canyon we are to explore. We have named it Flaming Gorge. Perched in a captain's chair set high in his boat, he entertains his crew as they float on with readings from Sir Walter Scott sent echoing through the canyons. Breathes there a man with soul so dead who never to himself hath said, This is my own, my native land. The native land that unfolded all about Major Powell was more than food for his eyes and nourishment for his soul. It was raw material for ideas he was to press home with the federal government. Ideas that looked to the potential of the land for generations to come. It was the vision of this extraordinary man that helped lead to the creation of the nation's Bureau of Reclamation. Fitting testament of this is the giant undertaking that shook the mountains beginning in 1956. This was the birth of Flaming Gorge Dam. See for yourself, from the laying of the first bucket of concrete, how this massive cork, as it has been called, came to stop up the space between the cliffs of the Red Canyon of the Green. The greatest thing that happened along the river since the Great Uplift 70 million years ago. Stretching a thousand feet across and over a hundred fifty feet wide at the base, gradually it rises to take shape. What is being built is designed from the start to be part of a huge overall plan. A plan including other dams in New Mexico, Colorado and Arizona. Dams working together as one to store, control, and regulate the available water resources of the Colorado Basin. Water which the concerned states shall equitably share. And each of the dams, like this one, the building a veritable rain barrel, holding back the precious liquid in time of heavy runoff, releasing it when it is needed below for farms communities, industries. In 1962, years after the first dream of it, the massive structure is topped out, and here, where there was nothing before, is planted at last a million cubic yards of rock, sand, and cement soaring 500 feet skyward to master the once unpredictable green, a vision finally materialized and dedicated to the lasting well-being of us all. Flaming Gorge Dam is a magnificent sight to see. But it is far more important for what it does than what it looks like. The lake it holds in reserve is literally the lifeblood of thousands of acres it helps to irrigate far from the dam itself. Indeed, in other states entirely, acres that otherwise would not get enough water, as well as new thousands of acres it helps bring to bloom. Yes, all this wonder is now carried by the Green River as it rolls southward along its course. But here, 
hundreds of feet below the crest, still another aspect of its presence can be discovered. The generation of hydroelectric power, vital energy for an energy-hungry country, power whose sale, along with fees collected from the water users, not only will make possible local participating projects in the upper basin area, but ultimately will repay almost the entire cost of the whole undertaking. The people who come to visit Flaming Gorge Dam enjoy, as well, the pleasuring promise of its surroundings. Enjoyment pre-planned, even before construction began. Such pleasure starts with immersing oneself in the beauty of the surroundings. Ashley National Forest, wherein Flaming Gorge Recreation Area is so uniquely contained. These lands are nurtured by the Forest Service not only as a constant source of inspiration, but to serve as a useful and dependable watershed and to provide timber too. Among the ponderosa pine standing solid and firm and the graceful aspen responding to the wind, peace is more than a word. And wild is the life that calls this forest home. And everywhere about for all to read, nature's own geologic history of the world, written in exposed stone that goes back to a billion years ago. To all this, the flaming gorge is like an overture. The storage lake created by the dam is more than a source of needed water. Its very depths provide the makings for happiness that only fishermen truly know. But it is in the stream below the dam that some fishermen find that special kind of heaven they dream of. Where once the seasonal fluctuation of the river made it hard for the fish to survive, today augmented by the stocking of fish in the river, below the dam for 20 miles or more, the green has become one of the finest trout streams in the whole nation. And along the same river that gives fishermen such pleasure, others find a different kind of contentment and adventure. But it is white water that, like an echo from the past, recalls the man whose wise vision helped bring it all about, Major John Wesley Powell, who called for the massive impounding of the green that its waters might serve people and agriculture and industry, as it does now. Powell, who doubtlessly challenged these very waters in their first serious exploration in his own wooden boats, leaping as he put it, and bounding like things of life. This, then, is the story of what we have here, a vital axis of a huge reclamation enterprise, assuring water to prosper the land, and along with it, an invaluable recreation area. All this born of the nation's need, fulfilled by separate arms of our government, joined in fitting cooperation to make the most of the resources with which nature has endowed this land. A tale that ends where it began with water. <laughs>